Dr. Tyler Nordgren is an astronomer, author, and artist at the University of Redlands in California. He has a PhD in astronomy from Cornell University, where he conducted research on dark matter in galaxies. His popular book on astronomy in the national parks is used to train national park rangers to give night sky programs. His Half the Park is After Dark posters are on sale in national parks across the country, while his 2017 Great American Eclipse poster series has received national attention, most recently from the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. His latest book, Sun, Moon, Earth, is on many must-read booklets for this year's eclipse. Please welcome Dr. Tyler Norgren. Uh, so thank you all for coming today. You know, just last week, we, we went past a milestone. We had the one month pre-anniversary of the eclipse, uh, the moon. The moon was a new moon, and so we are into that last orbit of the moon around the Earth before it encounters the sun is viewed from, from here in the United States. And in fact, this weekend, we've got a, another milestone that we've just gone across, and that's we are at the one solar day rotation before the eclipse. So the side of the sun that we're seeing right now is gonna be the side that we see during totality uh, three weeks from now. So all of these things that I know for myself, I've been waiting for since I was a nine-year-old boy, are finally coming true and happening. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to start off uh, by just reading for you the, the first couple pages uh, from my book, because it's, it's all about what you see during a total solar eclipse. And, and ultimately, uh, the science, the history, all of that is actually does pale in comparison to what you see, what you experience, because that is what really makes a total solar eclipse just an awe-inspiring event. Let me, let me see a show of hands. How many folks here have actually been to totality, seen a total solar eclipse? All right, so a, a few hands, all right, but a very few hands. And we'll find out why this is such a rare event and why so few hands just went up, so, all right. So let me read you. It's not even lunch yet when something takes a bite out of the sun. It's only a tiny notch at first, all but invisible without my cardboard eclipse glasses. Were it not for the shouts from the crowd around me on this August day, I would never have noticed. But now that I'm watching, I can see the bite grow bigger. It is the edge of our unseen moon. The sun is being eclipsed. It takes 40 minutes for the dark notch to grow so big the sun is now a crescent. But even with most of the sun covered, the heat of the day is still intense. I take off my glasses and take refuge under a tree. There in its shadow, I see a thousand bright crescents swaying in the grass to the time of the breeze in the treetops. Every one of them is an image of the sun projected on the ground when each tiny gap in the leaves overhead acts as a camera obscura, a pinhole camera. Nearby, children have spotted them too and begin to yell and giggle as they point and play with the bright little arcs. Had I not known what was happening before, this oddity would have certainly revealed the eclipse in progress above. After an hour has passed, only 20 minutes remain until totality begins. The life-giving nature of the sun is no longer an abstract concept. The sky has grown darker and colors are strangely wrong. The landscape is sapped of saturation. The worlds are aligning. With 10 minutes left, the conditions change quickly. The world is turned to twilight. The shadows of trees sharpen as if lit by a single spotlight. Instead of coming from a round yellow disc set amidst a bright blue sky, all illumination now comes from a narrow white crescent in the colorless dark vault. I put my glasses back on for these final moments of the partial phase and can see the remaining crescent shrink as I watch. The crowd rises, conversations hush, and I notice for the first time that all birdsong has ceased. The birds have returned to their nests to sleep in the unexpected night. An unseasonably cool wind blows across my arm as the temperature drops. The eclipse becomes a multi-sensory experience of sight, sound, and touch. So little of the sun is left that surely totality should begin at any second, but I can't tear my eyes away to look at my watch. Even the passage of time seems affected. These last few seconds seem to expand rather than diminish. Suddenly, the sun's thin sickle of light breaks apart into an array of brilliant specks that dance and shimmer along the dark moon's rim. 
They're called Bailey's Beats, the last rays of the vanishing sun streaming through actual mountain valleys along the curved lunar surface. I finally remove my protective glasses to see them quickly wink away until a glorious diamond ring appears, a single glistening star set in a band of white radiance encircling the moon. Then the spot collapses upon itself and is gone. We have reached totality. Where before there was light and heat, now there's only a cold black hole in the sky surrounded by a ghostly crown. The corona, a ring of immense pearly tendrils, envelops the darkness and stretches off into the sky in all directions. It is unimaginably beautiful and only ever visible during these few precious minutes of totality. All around it are the brighter stars and planets, invisible until now. It is a day that has become night at noon with the sun, moon, planets, and stars all overhead at once. As an astronomer, I know the mechanics of the celestial alignment, yet in this moment of totality, I fully understand the difference between knowledge and feeling. I missed my very first total solar eclipse. I was nine years old. It was 1979, and I was living down in Portland, Oregon, and totality went right over my house. But all the news I heard was so concentrated on the dangers of looking at the sun that I thought some special rays must come out during a solar eclipse and would burn your eyes out instantly if you accidentally looked at it. So I hid in my house with the curtains drawn. I watched the eclipse on the TV set. And in fact, I photographed my first eclipse right there off the television with my little <laughs> plastic camera. I have been waiting 38 years for this, 38 years. And in that time, I finally did get a chance to see an eclipse, like I, I described here in the book. It took 20 years to see it, though. It was 1999. And I realized when I finally saw it that 20 years earlier, I had been cheated of a life-changing experience. That fear is actually something quite human, though. It's something that has been a common occurrence for most eclipses throughout human history. There are stories from all over the world that talk about demons and animals and gods that swallow the sun, eat the sun, because for the vast majority of human history, these were things that happened without warning for the people that happened to live there. So you can find stories like, say, this one from uh, Hindu mythology, in which the, the bodiless head Rahu would grab the sun, I guess with the teeth, because there were no hands, um, and swallow the sun. And if you made a big enough racket, though, down below, you might actually scare Rahu, and Rahu would drop the sun from his mouth, and so the eclipse would only be a partial eclipse, not a total one. There's other stories that, that talk about the eclipse as being a, 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 a fight uh, in which you have um, a bear walking along the Milky Way. And this, this comes from the, the Pomo Indians in Northern California. And so here's a photograph I took of the Milky Way over Yosemite National Park. And, and for the Pomo, you had this bear that would walk along the Milky Way, a bear up there in the sky. And the bear would come in contact with the sun and they'd have a fight there on the Milky Way. And eventually, the bear would then continue on its way, but, but two weeks later would come upon the moon and would have a fight with the moon. And in this story, you see this connection between solar eclipses, the bear fighting with the sun, and lunar eclipses, the bear fighting with the moon. And in fact, that is what we see, that there are eclipses that are paired between lunar eclipses and two weeks either later or before solar eclipses. So in this fear, people attempted to make some sense of what they were seeing. And we do that today. So, for instance, when we take a look at eclipses, let's, let's see a show of hands. How many folks have seen a lunar eclipse? Okay, far more hands go up. All right, so what you're seeing with a lunar eclipse is the moon traveling into the shadow of the Earth. So, we have a picture, uh, okay, up there on top. Up there on top, the moon moves into the shadow of the Earth, and so every single person on the night side of the Earth who has that view of the moon gets to see a lunar eclipse. So as a result, many, many people have had a chance to see that moon as it goes into the Earth's shadow. It takes on this, this amazing dark orangish light as in the moments of totality when the sun, the Earth, and the moon are all lined up, the only light that falls onto that full moon is light that's filtered through the atmosphere of the Earth. And so in this 
orangeness that you see here, this blood moon that's come to be called over the last few years thanks to the internet, in this terrible sounding blood moon, what you're actually seeing is the orange light of every single sunrise and sunset happening on the earth at that moment. I find that just incredibly beautiful and moving. Well, uh, the next total lunar eclipse that's gonna be visible here from the United States actually happens in January. Now you might, you might wonder, well, well, wait a second, you just said that lunar eclipses and solar eclipses uh, are paired up. So when is the lunar eclipse that's gonna be paired up with this solar eclipse? Well, it's happening on August 7th, so a week from now. Unfortunately, it's not gonna be a total lunar eclipse. The moon is just barely grazing through the Earth's shadow. And it's not gonna be visible on the nighttime here in North America. It's gonna be visible for folks in Europe and Asia. So we're gonna to totally miss it. And you might think, oh, woe is us, but hey, we get the solar eclipse that's happening just two weeks later. All right, and it's two weeks later because it takes about two weeks to go from full moon to new moon, where the moon passes between the Earth and the sun, and that's what gives us solar eclipses. Now, there's two flavors of solar eclipses, and that's because the orbit the moon makes around the Earth isn't a perfect circle. It's an ellipse, and what that means is that sometimes it's a little closer to the Earth, sometimes a little farther away. And we happen to be pretty lucky here in that we've got a big moon that happens to appear just the right size to completely cover the sun. That is something that is unique for moons and planets here in our solar system. We're the only ones that really get this. But that distance is just pretty tenuous. The change in how big the moon appears is about 10% between when we have, say, full moon at its closest and full moon when it's farthest away. If you get a solar eclipse when the moon is at its farthest point, it won't completely cover the sun, and you get something called an annular eclipse down here on the bottom. And here's a photograph of a sequence of an annular eclipse. The moon, the dark curve of the moon, passes between us and the sun, and if you're in the path of total alignment, you get an annular eclipse, a ring of fire. We actually did have something like that happen here in the United States relatively recently, and that was back in 2012. During May of that year, there was an annular eclipse visible from a bunch of national parks and monuments in the American Southwest, about a dozen of them. And because of the work that I'd been doing with national parks about the Milky Way and stars and, and getting people to, to appreciate what you could see at night there in the parks, well, this was a wonderful opportunity to, to do some advertising for let's get people to come see this, this kind of a strange thing. And I happen to be out in Chaco Culture National Historical Park. Uh, it's a wonderful little monument that uh, no paved road leads to in northwestern New Mexico. And in there, in this little valley, there are these thousand-year-old great houses that were built by the, the ancestral Puebloan people. We, we used to call them the Anasazi. And there, standing in the middle of what used to be the largest building in North America, I was able to see this annular eclipse right at sunset. And you actually could feel the temperature drop out there in the desert as you stood within the partial shadow of the moon. All along the path of uh, annularity that day, parks and monuments set one-day attendance records. And it was our first inkling that something big was going to be happening this year for the total solar eclipse. Now, there's been some interesting science that has been done with things like these annular eclipses. Back in 478 BCE, so about 2,500 years ago, a Greek philosopher by the name of Anaxagoras, he was the one that first proposed that eclipses, at least as far as we know in Western civilization, that eclipses were the result of this light and shadow between the sun, the moon, and the earth. So he got the right idea for what was going on during this annular eclipse, that you were standing within the shadow of the moon. And that made him realize some really important things. If an annular eclipse or a solar eclipse is the moon moving in front of the sun, then that means the moon has to be closer to the earth than the sun. Well, hey, that's pretty neat. And if the two appear about the same size in the sky and the sun is farther away, then that means the sun has to be bigger than the moon. Well, that's pretty neat too. And then the third thing that occurred to him is if he could measure the size of that shadow sweeping across the earth, then he knew that the moon had to be at least that big. So he could get you a, a lower limit, a lower boundary. 
to how big the moon must be. So how do you go about 2,500 years ago measuring the size of the moon's shadow as it sweeps across the countryside? There was no GPS. You couldn't call up your friend over in Sparta. Hey, did you happen to see that ring of fire in the sky? But he could do the next best thing. So Anaxagoras, he lived in Athens, which was a port city. And in fact, it was the most important port city in the Mediterranean at the time. So he went down to the port and got talking to the sailors as they came in. And he began to ask them, hey, did you happen to see that ring of fire last week? And if they said yes, well, where were you? Where were you when you saw it? And if they said no, well, where were you when you saw it, when you didn't see it? And by putting together where people were who did and didn't see it, he came up with an estimate for how big the moon must be. And uh, we know this because about 500 years later, almost 600 years later, uh, a Roman uh, philosopher wrote about it. Plutarch wrote that Anaxagoras says that the moon is large as the Peloponnesus, the, the, the Greek peninsula. And so here was somebody standing on a shore in ancient Greece, looking up, and by figuring out that this wasn't a demon, it wasn't a bear, but a physical phenomenon, doing the first astronomical measurements of bodies in our solar system. He could look up into the heavens and know the order in which things were and at least how big they had to be. This is the origin of astronomy. All right, but as amazing as that is, that is not what we're going to be getting this year because on August 21st, when the moon moves in front of the sun, it's gonna be near its closest approach and so it will appear large enough to completely cover the sun. And so you're gonna get a partial eclipse as that moon slowly moves across the disk of the sun. It's gonna take about uh, an hour, hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes to do this. And then when the alignment is perfect, we'll get that last little speck of light, that diamond ring as that last little bit of the sun disappears behind a crater or a valley on the edge of the moon. And then we get totality, total solar eclipse. At all points leading up to that, at all points in that partial phase before that diamond ring, you need to use eclipse glasses. And it's not because there are any special rays that come out of the sun. The sun isn't any more dangerous than it is today. Uh, I realize up here in Seattle, seeing the sun is a rare event, okay? So people ask, why, why the worry? Why, why is there so much attention put on this? Well, it's because on normal days, days like this, we go outside and our brains know, hey, kid, don't look at the sun. On the day of the eclipse, though, we know that the moon is beginning to move in front of it. So another part of our brain tries to overwhelm and override the sensible part of our brain that says, hey, don't look at the sun. So it's not a change in the sun, it's a change in us, a change in how we approach the sun. People want to spend more time staring at it. And if you spend more time staring at it, you put all that sun's light on one part of your retina, and you have the ability to do damage to your, to your eye. So that's why we warn people. You want to see what's going on. You want to see that sun turn into a, a narrow little crescent. And up here in, in Seattle, you're going to have 95% of the sun's disk covered. That's going to be a lot. That sun is going to look like a thin little fingernail by the time you get to maximum partial phase. In order to see that, you need those little eclipse glasses. Okay. When totality happens, you get to see the corona. That's one of the big features. The sun turns black, and this corona, these ghostly tendrils come out. Every single eclipse has a completely different corona associated with it, and that's because the shape of that corona depends upon the magnetic fields uh, that are being generated at that moment on the, on the sun. So I've seen totality successfully twice uh, in my life, but I will never get a chance to see the corona that was visible that day back in 1979. So for that reason, you know, I, I encourage folks, if you've got the chance, don't pass it up. Go and see totality. Um, one of the other features that's, that's sometimes visible during a, a total solar eclipse are these red flames, these prominences. These are actual eruptions of gas off the surface of the sun. And you can see a, a photograph here. This is actually a, a photograph from that 1999 eclipse that I saw. And there was one of these red flames, these red prominences that was so huge, it actually detached itself. It left the sun off on the, the right-hand side there. 
Well, when, when people back in the mid-1800s developed a technology where you could pass this light through a prism and break it apart into like a, a rainbow, they discovered something about this light. And what you see here is what's called a spectrum. The, the light is passed through a prism. It's been broken apart into its component wavelengths, its component colors. And we see something really fascinating. Those prominences, those red flames, they, they show up at about uh, pretty four different wavelengths, four different colors. There's the red over here where they're the brightest. There's also some over here in the, the teal, down here in the purple, and, and over here in the yellow. And the chemists and the physicists of the mid-1800s realized, wait a second, that's the signature of hydrogen gas. Different elements give off different light when heated up, when excited, when, uh, when, when those, the electrons get energy. We see this kind of light given off by atoms today uh, in neon signs. We call them neon signs because it's neon gas that's inside these gas tubes and they're excited by electricity and they give off light. Well, every single element has its own special fingerprint of colors that it gives off when it gets excited. Hydrogen gas gives off light in the red, in the teal, and the purple, in the purple. It does not give off light there in the orange. And the chemists back in the mid-1800s, they realized that, they experimented, they tried every way they could get hydrogen gas to give off that color of orange light. Eventually they had to, to admit, there is no way to get hydrogen to do this. And in fact, we know of no other element that does that, that gives off that particular color of orange light. And so they said, this must be a new element on the sun. We shall name it after the sun, we shall call it helium. How many folks here have heard of helium? All right. It took another 26 years for helium to be discovered here on the Earth. So every party balloon that you've ever had, that gas inside it was first discovered. That type of gas was first discovered on the sun. And so again, like Anaxagoras standing here on the Earth, by looking at the light that we got, we could actually take a sample of the sun and figure out what it was made out of. Now, there was another color here that you might say, wait a second, there's something there in the green. What is that? Well, that light given off in the green wasn't coming from those prominences. It wasn't coming from those flames. It was, in fact, coming from the corona all around the disk of the moon. And so the same folks back in the mid-1800s began to think, hey, it worked so well for us this first time when we discovered helium. Maybe we've got a new element here. We'll call it coronium. All right. How many folks learned about coronium in your high school chemistry class? Anybody? Okay, neither did I. The reason for that is they could not find any other evidence of this element. And eventually, around about the 1930s, what they discovered was this wasn't a brand new element, but rather iron. Iron that had 13 of its 26 electrons stripped away. In order to do that, you need to be at an incredibly high temperature. Now, the surface of the sun that gives off that light that we see that, that you know, is the reason why you shouldn't look at the sun, kid? All right, that light is given off because the surface of the sun is at a temperature of about 6,000 degrees uh, Kelvin, uh, which is about Celsius. But the corona, the corona is at a temperature of over a million degrees. And that's why it's able to strip all those electrons off of iron. So when, during totality, you see that corona, you are seeing the hottest thing that any human being will ever see with our own eyes. And it's one of the things that makes it so absolutely beautiful, at least to me. So in this view of the corona, we are seeing temperatures and conditions that have no similarity here on the Earth. And it makes it so beautiful that it's only visible for a few fractions of a minute, maybe two, in this case, for this eclipse that's coming up, the most time that anyone will have in order to see this corona is two minutes and 40 seconds out in Kentucky. All right, the last little thing I wanna tell you about that, that, that I find just amazing and how these eclipses have changed our view of the universe is perhaps the most famous solar eclipse among scientists. And this had to do with one that took place in 1919. Albert Einstein had come up with this idea that gravity was the result not of a force pulling together two objects, but by having mass, an object would actually warp 
a four-dimensional space-time, the fabric of space and time itself. And so something as big as the sun would sit within a pucker, a warp, a, a divot out in this fabric of space. Well, how could you discover this? How could you actually test this? And what these scientists realized, what Einstein himself realized, is that if you could look at a total solar eclipse, you might be able to see this bending of light. So here's what's going on. We've got the sun over here. It's sitting on this fabric of space. Think of it like maybe it's a, a rubber trampoline. And the mass of the sun warps the surface of that trampoline. Well, if you could look at a distant star, maybe a star that was just behind the sun or close to being behind the sun, as that star's light would travel to us, the light would encounter this divot, this warp, and have its path slightly curved so that the sunlight appears to be coming from this direction. So we here on Earth, we think the star is over here, when in reality, it's closer to the sun. Okay, well, you may be asking me, all right, but how do we see stars during the daytime? Normally, that's when you don't see stars. Ah, but during a total solar eclipse, during those few precious minutes, the sun is darkened, the sky goes dark, and stars are visible near the sun. So in 1919, an expedition was set into the path of totality. Uh, one expedition went to South America, the other went to Africa. And both groups had identical cameras that they could use to photograph the total solar eclipse and capture the image of any stars that were visible near the sun on that day. They could then compare those star positions to the exact same pattern of stars when the sun wasn't present. And what they found is that there was actually a change. The presence of the sun, its mass, its gravity, actually affected the images of the stars that we received and where they appeared. And so here's one of those photographs. You see it's a negative. You see a negative image of the sun, the corona, and in between all these little hash marks, a little too faint to be seen right here, is a tiny little dot where a star was located. The results of this were so astounding to people, both to scientists, but also to the press, that the press, when they heard about this, well, on the left here, we, we see some of the headlines that came from the New York Times that were reported just two days later. And I love this. Lights all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. And as somebody who's, who's had to deal with publishers to get a book published, I love this, this one down at the bottom here. A book for 12 wise men, no more in all the world could comprehend it, said Einstein when his daring publishers accepted it. Okay, so. This eclipse, this total solar eclipse in 1919, it's what made science, what Einstein revolutionize physics. But it's also, thanks to the newspaper reporting, what made Einstein, well, Einstein. We all know of Einstein today as the crazy-haired guy with the mustache and the tongue sticking out because of the popular press and how they treated the results of this eclipse. All right, so you know, when we look out into space, now, I mentioned before that we here on Earth, we are the only planet in our solar system that has a moon at just the right size and just the right distance to see eclipses. But we've actually been using these eclipses to do other really interesting things. For instance, discovering planets around other stars. So when you look up a star-filled sky here, and you look at the Milky Way, and you see billions of stars, about 100 billion stars within our own galaxy. We've, over the last 10 years, begun to discover other planets around those stars by essentially looking at very tiny little solar eclipses. So here's a, a diagram of what happens. You have a planet around one of those distant specks of light. As that planet happens to move in front of its star, it blocks a little bit of that light that reaches us here on the Earth. So it's a very tiny little annular eclipse, kinda. We can see the starlight dip for a period of time as the planet travels in front. And by looking for those little dips in starlight, we can figure out that, A, there's a planet there. By looking at how much that light dips, we can figure out how big the planet must be. Well, just this last spring, something really amazing was discovered. One of those stars had not just one planet around it, but seven. It was a star called Trappist-1. And what you see here on the left are seven different dips from those different planets and they were able to figure out how big each of those planets is, and by looking at how long it took 
uh, from one dip to the next. They could figure out how long it took the planets to go around the star. They could then figure out the size of the orbit, uh, and they could learn about this little system. And so what you see here on the right is a, a little scale model of this little planetary system. Now, some fascinating things here. First of all, these planets all orbit really, really close to their star. Uh, in fact, all seven of them, if you were to put them in our solar system, all seven of them are much closer than the planet Mercury is to our sun. So this is a tiny little solar system. Also, the, the star there that they, or, they orbit is only about 10% the, the, the size of our own. So it's even a tiny little star. So it's a tiny little star with a tiny little solar system. But each of those planets, based upon the size of their dip, each of those planets is actually about the size of the Earth. They have about the same mass of the Earth, and they've got about the same size. So that means they're probably little rocky worlds, maybe something like the Earth. Okay. And here's an artist's conception of what these seven little planets might look like. Now, the, the distance between the little planets here in this drawing are, are not to scale. But there is something very special about just how close they are all to one another. And that's because... If you were to stand on one of those planets and look up into the sky, you might see one of the other planets in your little solar system. Now, here on Earth, if you go out, like, say, last night, I happened to see the moon. Did anybody look at the moon last night? Next to it was a, was a bright star. That was a planet. That was Jupiter. Now, all the other planets in our solar system, they're far enough away that when they do get close, you see them as bright stars. But they only appear as bright stars to the naked eye. You need a telescope to see an actual disk but not from a planet in this solar system. You could stand on one of those planets, and every time one of the other planets came close, it would actually appear about as big as the full moon and maybe even a little bit bigger. So you could actually see neighboring planets grow large enough in the sky that you could see features on the other planet. Well, I sat down and I did some math. If you were to actually go to the seventh planet, Trappist-1h, the next planet in, G, not only appears large enough that you could see some features on it, but it actually approaches within the error bars that the scientists reported. It actually could be large enough to completely cover the sun. This may be the only other place that we know of in our galaxy. I'm sure there's others, but this is one that we know of where you could actually see a solar eclipse from one planet caused by another. So this is what we learn by looking at the shadows that stretch from one planet, one world, to the next. And this is what we're going to be seeing on August 21st. In our case, the moon is going to pass between us and the sun. Its shadow is going to stretch from the surface of the moon to the surface of the Earth. And if we're lucky enough to be in the path of totality, you'll be able to see this. And so what you can see here is this path of totality stretches from coast to coast. It goes from Oregon to South Carolina. While it's been since 1979, 38 years since the last eclipse touched the U.S., that eclipse only went through the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana. This is going to be the first eclipse in 99 years to stretch from coast to coast. Uh, and so everybody's going to chance to see at least a partial eclipse that day. So this is going to be a truly national event. Uh, for up here, uh, the closest pace, place that totality is going to pass is down Oregon. Uh, south of Portland, unfortunately. Uh, goes almost directly over Salem. Uh, I will say, for those folks that are planning on driving down there, uh, down the Willamette Valley to see this, do plan accordingly. The folks in Portland are scared. Um, this is happening, totality is going to happen in Oregon in the morning. This is a Monday morning. Uh, and so you're going to have Monday rush hour traffic in Portland, and they're worried about how many Seattle folks are going to be attempting to drive all the way through the Portland metropolitan area during the midst of morning rush hour. So if you are planning on heading down, my recommendation is do it in the middle of the night. Uh, if you can, if there's any way that you can get down there that weekend before, awesome. But if you have to wait until Sunday, at, that Sunday to Monday, go down in the middle of the night. Get down there. Get into that path of totality in darkness if you can. Uh, that way, hopefully, you can avoid as much of the traffic as possible. All right. Uh, the, the path of totality extends upward almost to Beaverton, uh, not quite all the way. Um, and so there you are. The, the path of totality, even though it stretches from coast to coast, it's only about 60 to 70 miles wide north and south. Uh, it then goes out in eastern Oregon. Uh, a lot of folks are going to head out there. I myself am going to be heading out there. 
Uh, but the, the shadow of the moon starts right there on the Pacific coast. So uh, right in Newport, uh, Quinnahead Lighthouse is going to be the first place to see totality that day. From there, that shadow is going to sweep across the Willamette Valley, across some amazing wine country. Uh, do highly recommend that if you can. Uh, best Pinot Noirs anywhere. From there, it goes over the Cascades. Uh, in fact, Mount Jefferson is going to be one of the mountains in the path of totality. And here is something that I think is going to be absolutely spectacular if you've got the chance. Um, number one goal, get into the path of totality. Number two, if you can find it, is get a view of the Cascades. Uh, you're going to be able to see if the weather's clear, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Jefferson. Uh, so a number of those great stratovolcanoes, but only one of them is in the path of totality. So as the shadow of the moon sweeps over you, first of all, depending upon where you are, there'll be several seconds difference between when totality hits you and when it hits those mountains. And secondly, when totality does hit those mountains, only one of them is gonna go dark. The others will stay lit up. From there, we sweep out through Eastern Oregon. Uh, John Day Fossil Beds National Monument is one of the smaller national monuments. It's in the path of totality. Uh, they are terrified of the potential 20,000 people trying to show up there that day. Uh, they, their estimate is that their entire annual visitation is all going to come that weekend. Yeah. Uh, and then we head out through Grant County, places like uh, the town of John Day. Highway 26 runs right along the path of totality. So ideally, that would be a great place uh, to, to travel back and forth, depending upon what clouds may be doing. Uh, but again, the local folks are terrified. Highway 26 has one lane each direction. Oop. Almost no shoulder. I drove it last year. And so the worry is what happens if it's cloudy in one direction, suddenly 50,000 people all decide to pick up and try to drive the other direction. So uh, yes, uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation is hoping for the best, but they are planning for the worst. From there, after going across Oregon, the shadow of the moon traveling at about 1,000 miles per hour uh, goes over Idaho. Bora Peak is going to be one of the largest mountains up there. From there, you go across the, the biggest national park that's going to be in the path of totality, probably the most visited one uh, at this point, uh, Grand Tetons. Uh, they're totally overwhelmed, but they are a big tourist destination, so lots and lots of hotels, lodges, campgrounds, and things. So if any place has got a handle on this, these folks will. Uh, it then sweeps across Wyoming into Nebraska, where a tiny little homestead national monument is going to be in the path of totality. I actually think at this point, if anybody has the ability to, Nebraska is probably going to be pretty good because there's lots of roads that will lead into totality. We then get Missouri. Uh, the University of Missouri uh, is in the path of totality. I spent last night with a, an alum from there. Uh, it's amazing how much Missouri swag they've got. Um, but as a place that's a large university with a large football team, they've got a large stadium. Uh, and so imagine potentially 50,000 people showing up in a stadium to see this happen high overhead. Because by the time you got to Missouri, it's now happening about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Then goes over St. Louis, but only half of St. Louis, southern half of St. Louis. The St. Louis Arch is going to miss totality by about a mile. We then sweep across the Mississippi to southern Illinois. These folks are lucky in that they are on the crossroads to the next total solar eclipse. 2024, April 8th, is when the next total solar eclipse is going to touch the United States. This eclipse is going to go from Texas up through New York, and it crosses right here in southern Illinois. So these folks get to see two in seven years from their doorstep. From there, you go through Kentucky, down into Tennessee, where Nashville is going to be the largest city totally in totality. We then go over uh, Great Smoky Mountains, and from the Great Smoky Mountains, we head out to the sea of South Carolina. It's going to take 90 minutes for this path, uh, to the moon to travel from coast to coast. And during that time, every single person in the United States is going to be in at least a part of the moon's shadow. And it's truly a national event. 12 million people live within the path of totality. And the question is, how many more are going to travel down there to see it? So Oregon, based upon uh, geographic information systems of populations and roads, these are going to be the main routes that people are going to be taking to get into that path of totality within Oregon. And you can obviously see that the, the big one is from Seattle down through Portland and from San Francisco uh, up to, to that path as well. Uh, but you are going to have some folks out in Spokane uh, heading on down to eastern Oregon. So how many people are going to make the drive? Nobody knows. It's totally unknown at this point. 
uh, you could have maybe only 174,000 people driving to Oregon on that day. Or you could have almost three quarter of a million people making that drive. Nobody knows. One thing I will suggest, uh, I've got a good friend from high school who works for the Department of Transportation here in Washington. Uh, do not stop on the freeway. As, you, as totality comes along, wherever you may happen to be, do not just stop your car. Uh, also, do not attempt to drive while wearing solar eclipse glasses. Right? You, that will be impossible. Okay, so pull over somewhere safely into a parking lot, not into the grass, because it's dry. So pull over somewhere safely. The, the partial phase of the eclipse that's visible up here, it's gonna last over an hour, so you got lots of time to find someplace neat, someplace pretty, someplace safe to pull over and take a look at it with your eclipse glasses. Okay, but because of all of this, I mean, this is why this is the great American, the all-American total solar eclipse this year. It truly will be a national event, and it will be the most viewed total solar eclipse in history because of those 2,000 miles of totality. And since it's happening in this age of social media, it will become the most shared, the most tweeted, everyone's got a camera in your pocket, the most photographed. This will be the biggest event in social media history. And if anything is ever capable of breaking the internet, this will be it. So I wanna thank you all for coming today and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, so why is there a difference in time based on location? A uh, couple features. First of all, the shadow of the moon, it's shaped like a big ellipse, squish circle. So if you're at one of the northern edges or the southern edge of totality, uh, you'll get totality, you'll get the sky going dark, the sun turning black, the corona being visible, and the stars coming out. You'll get that, but because the shadow of the moon will be just barely a tiny little cross section as it passes over you, totality will be very short uh, near the north and, and south uh, limb of totality. The longest duration will be right there along the midline. It also changes as you go east or west, and that has to do with the projection of that shadow on the earth. Um, we're gonna be seeing it here on the west coast, in morning. So if you imagine yourself sort of as a sun view from a person, say, sitting on the sun looking at the earth, that shadow of the moon as it sweeps across from west to east, uh, it's gonna be going very fast as, it's, as it encounters that, ed, that curved edge of the earth. So that's why we have a much shorter duration here on the west coast than the folks, say, uh, towards Kentucky where they get a full two minutes and 40 seconds. Where I'm gonna be out in John Day, I'll have something like about two minutes, 10 seconds. So it's not a huge change. Other questions? The gradual. Okay, great question. All right, so you're gonna be able to see the, the tendrils of the corona that are, are caused by the conditions of the magnetic field at that moment. Now, the, the longest duration anybody's gonna to have to see that corona is about two minutes and 40 seconds, and that's out east. But there are two groups this year. One's called the Mega Movie Project, the other one's called Citizen Kate. Uh, that are doing something special. Because this path of totality has over 2,000 miles of uninterrupted inhabited landscape, they have got, uh, let's go with the Sis and Kate folks first, something like 100 identical telescope and camera systems that uh, astronomy clubs, universities, high schools, groups have uh, worked with that are gonna be set up all along that path of totality, each group recording its image of totality and what the corona looks like. And then they're gonna stitch them all together and you will have a single 90 minute long video of what the corona does during that 90 minutes. So in that 90 minutes, you will maybe be able to see changes in structure, the evolution of the corona and, and how it goes on. The folks with the Mega Movie Project out of uh, Berkeley uh, they're asking for folks uh, who are photographing the eclipse to send in their photographs and put them all together. Um, and so with Sis and Kate, it's identical cameras, identical telescopes. Uh, with Mega Movie, personally, I think it's gonna be more of a really amazing citizen art project, uh, but either one, it's never been done before. It'll be absolutely amazing. Yes, 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 during totality, it is 100% safe to look at totality without the glasses, 
with your naked eye. In fact, you need to do that. Those glasses are designed to dim the sun by a factor of one million. And that's why sunglasses, just regular sunglasses, don't, won't work. Uh, they're not good enough. You need something that, that blocks out the visible, the ultraviolet, and the infrared, which is what those little paper glasses do. So when totality comes, when you get that diamond ring, that's going to be your signal to take your glasses off, at which point totally perfectly safe, and then when the second diamond ring comes, that's your signal, shows over, put the glasses back on again. And at that point, everybody's celebrating anyway, and nobody's staring at the sun at all. Um, so, okay, uh, but so you've got, if you get those paper glasses, and NASA is recommending those brands, uh, American Paper Optics, um, Rainbow Symphony, uh, TSE 2017, Total Solar Eclipse 2017, uh, GreatAmericanEclipse.com, rats, I've totally forgotten what the fifth one is. Okay, well, fine. Um, and these are glasses that identify themselves as being CE certified, ISO certified. There may be other ones out there that are perfectly safe, but we can't guarantee where they've come from, what the manufacturing is. So that's why NASA is concentrating on those, those five. Uh, but yeah, okay, so yeah, keep them on, on kids. Um, you know, if, if somebody glances at the sun, if it's only for a second or so, that's fine, that's going to be okay. Um, just don't stare at it. And so maybe this goes out to the teenage boys in the audience, all right? Don't, <laughs> this is not gonna be a competition to see who can stare at the sun longer, all right? So this should be fine. Uh, but other ways to look at the partial phase of the eclipse, if you can't get to totality or during the lead up to totality, do things like look for those pinhole projections. Look at the shadows and trees and the little crescents that get there. That's a lot of fun. Um, a straw hat or interleaving your fingers to make little gaps in there. Those are all incredibly fun ways to see the sun projected onto the ground. So in order to do that, you're looking directly away from the sun. So that's, that's safe too. Another thing to do is get a big thick piece of cardboard and punch a hole in there. And then you can use that to project an image of the sun. And again, you'll be staring away from the sun at that point. And so that's also safe. And you can have all sorts of fun making different shapes with different pinholes, spell out your name, and then take a little photograph of it. So there you go. Other questions? Yes, sir. Thanks for coming out. It was a really great talk. Oh, thank um, you. Wondering about photographing it with just consumer grade uh, cameras, do you need to put a filter on it, or what do you recommend there? Okay, so uh, photography. Um, my first recommendation is don't. Uh, only, only because if you're gonna be in, in totality, you've got two minutes maximum here of, of totality. Um, you don't wanna waste that time fiddling around with your camera. But if you're going to do it, make sure you've practiced with your camera, that you know exactly how to have that thing focused at infinity, how to take uh, photos with maybe different exposure times. Um, so have all of that be second nature. You're going to need probably a tripod to do this. Um, so practice uh, with that. Normal com uh, commercial grade cameras, are they safe to point at the sun? My feeling is if I don't want to look at the sun with my own eyes, I don't want to point my camera at the sun. But I, I got a big like $5,000 camera at home. Um, so for that, I put a little filter over for the partial phase. You know, if it's your iPhone, I'm sure, I, heaven knows, I've taken photographs of sunsets with my iPhone, so I've had the sun shining into, into this thing before, so it's probably fine, but depending on how much money you spend on your iPhone, hey, point at the sun at your own risk there. I, I wouldn't, but it's probably okay? I don't know. Um, so my, my feeling is, I'm just gonna to try to experience this, take photographs of maybe you, your family, have maybe your iPhone, if you're gonna use that, or a commercial normal camera set on a little tripod, photographing the landscape. Um, and those are the photographs that are gonna be amazing because they're gonna be personal to you. Um, those big photographs that you saw, the close-up ones of the sun, the corona, I promise you, the day after the eclipse, the internet is gonna be flooded with amazing images far better than what you can take, far better than what I can take. Uh, so let those folks take those photos. Get, get the ones that are meaningful of you, your family, your location. So, there you go. And there, and there are a number of websites uh, on there, uh, on the web, that will give you better uh, photo uh, photographic suggestions.
uh, we are at minimum. That will have zero effect on the quality of the experience. It will just change the quality of the experience. Uh, because we're at solar minimum, it's an 11-year cycle, there are very few sunspots on the sun right now. And so the magnetic fields aren't as twisted and warped. Um, no, they still are, but not quite as much as normal. So we may not see prominences, but who knows? Uh, it just depends on if a sunspot group comes up between now and then uh, and where it happens to be on the sun at that time. So the corona changes. During maximum, the corona becomes very flattened out and it kind of looks like a big dart or a big arrowhead. Uh, during minimum, you wind up with the corona being sort of more uniform in all directions. So it just changes the look of it. So. Uh, rats, I should have put this in here. Just this morning, the National Solar Observatory came out with their prediction for what the corona will look like. Because we are at the one solar rotation anniversary right now, the magnetic fields that are currently being seen on the sun will probably be those that are visible when the sun makes its full complete turn in the next 24 days. So there's an estimate of what it might look like on the internet, and so you can find that from the National Solar Observatory. Other questions? Great questions. So first place to get uh, copies of those posters is right here in the, st in the store uh, of, the, uh, of the museum. So they've got a bunch of them in there. Um, if, if there's some other ones that you saw that you'd like, that you would prefer, uh, my website up there, tylernordgren.com. Um, just so you know, uh, any order that comes in before the 6th, August 6th, I should be able to send you. Uh, anything after the 6th, and you'll get it sent after the eclipse because I am leaving town um, on the uh, 10th in order to make my way up to Oregon to, to, to see it. So, but uh, I take all, take all orders. Uh, now, in terms of the folks in Chaco, could they predict it? Well, they were, they were obvious astronomers. Uh, there's lots of evidence that they paid attention to the sun, some evidence they paid attention to the moon. There's even a evidence, potential evidence, that they did observe a total solar eclipse there about a thousand years ago. There's a, a, a petroglyph on one of the rocks, it's an east-facing rock, that looks like a pecked out circle with big curly cues all around it, and possibly the planet Venus nearby. Now, of course, we have no idea what it means, but it's a unusual pictograph. It looks like nothing else, petroglyph, looks like nothing else, and we do know that at the height of the civilization there a thousand years ago, there was a total solar eclipse that went directly over them that would have been visible off to the east. So, yep, other questions? Okay, um, so the, the next big eclipses are gonna be coming up. Uh, 2019, uh, July, I think it's July 2nd, uh, down in Chile, so South America, uh, it'll come in over the Pacific Ocean and go right over central Chile, so that one should be gorgeous. Um, 2024, here in the United States, uh, unlike this one that manages to avoid most major cities, the one in 2024 goes over a lot of big cities. Uh, Dallas, I think San Antonio, Indianapolis, Cleveland, Buffalo, Montreal, so lots of hotel rooms for that one. It even goes right over Niagara Falls. I did some calculations. If you stand right there on the American side of the falls, uh, you look up, it'll be about 45 degrees straight up over the falls as viewed from the American side there. So I, I call dibs on that stretch of uh, railing. Um, let's see, then other, other really good ones. Uh, got a bunch in the book. I know for myself, 2033, there's one that's gonna be visible in Alaska, which is where I'm, I'm originally from. It's gonna go over Nome and then out through uh, uh, Point Barrow, the northernmost point in North America. It's gonna be happening in March. Uh, March is a good time to see the northern lights. And so one of the feelings I've got is that imagine if you're standing there within totality, it goes dark enough that you can see the stars and what if the aurora are happening at that moment? Wouldn't that be neat? Okay, uh, let's see, some other ones. Uh, there's one that's gonna be in Spain coming up in the 2020s. Uh, there's another one that goes right over Gibraltar, and oh, right over Egypt, the Temple of Luxor along the Nile. Uh, it's gonna happen near noon, and totality is gonna last for about six minutes. So imagine standing in the midst of an Egyptian temple, rows of columns, and directly above you, is this eclipse overhead for six whole minutes. I just shudder to think of that one. So yeah, lots of good ones coming up. And, and really the, the thing at that point is for those folks that, that get the eclipse bug, which will happen to you if you see totality, uh, is you start to confront your own mortality. 
how long should I be planning out possible eclipses I could go see? Well, yeah, you know, the, the thing that we astronomers are really, really hoping for is that this will, will usher in, a, be a watershed moment for driving interest in science and astronomy. I was really lucky that in 1979 down Portland, Oregon, in about a two-year period, I saw a solar eclipse. Uh, in 1980, I got to see Mount St. Helens erupt, uh, so I got to see our planet change. Uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos was on TV, and the Voyager spacecraft were traveling out through Jupiter and Saturn. So there was this two-year period where everything happened to drive my young interest in astronomy and science, and it set me on the path to be who I am today. Uh, and so here we have an opportunity, maybe, for something similar to that happening. Yes, people throughout history have thought of solar eclipses as omens of doom, and if, if you really want to be that sort of a person, maybe you can associate something in 2017 that this eclipse will be an omen of doom for, but, but really, it's an opportunity for all of us to share in this national moment that has nothing bad about it and is yet a truly awe-inspiring event, the alignment of worlds, the moon, the sun, and ultimately you here on Earth. So that's what I'm really looking forward to. Thank you very much. All right, thank you.